On this digital clip, we're going to look at a tool called the reverse bow tie. The reverse bow tie is a combination of many different models that our coaches will have learned over the three or six day business coaching course. And it requires them to understand some key concepts. Then we can glue them all together and do an accident or excellence investigation to find out why we got it right or why we got it wrong. Because more often than not, we only investigate behaviors when somebody got it wrong. And the mission, I guess, most of the time is to find out who to blame, not necessarily prevent anybody else from making the same mistake or recognizing that the mistake was a cultural issue or a system failure rather than just an individual choice. So we start by looking at the negative experiences of the accident in the first place. And our mission is to drive the experience of the individual who had the accident down to the lowest possible level on logical levels, down at low level environment, or at best, the effect of their behavior. This allows people the openness and security to report accidents and incidents without feeling like they get blamed. If you consider how some organizations get it wrong, in one power station, many years ago, we used to have a situation where you did the walk of shame. If you were the person that lost the safety record, you got to walk down the drive to the end of the site and change the so many days since we had an accident back to zero. Now, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't be reporting my accidents if that's what I had to do. Whether it's the way we communicate it, the way we report it, how we look after the injured party, how we communicate it around the team, there is always something we can learn from the positive experiences after every accident. Our mission when we do the second part of the reverse bow tie is to look at how can we amplify the positive effects of having this accident. Because we simply want people to report everything they do. Unless we celebrate success and celebrate the things we get from those reports, we'll never get more. The next step in the process is how do we make any of the negative experiences more positive? And how do we make them more real and now? How do we share the learnings and the experiences that we get from this accident or incident and share them in a way which allows people to try them on for size? So some great things you'll have seen other businesses do. Somebody has an accident and rather than discipline them or sack them, you say to them, well, you can come back to work, but what we want you to do is personally go out and brief the teams on your experiences. So the real and now phase is about looking at the experiences, both positive and negative, and making sure that we nail them home so everybody gets to learn for free. The next challenge for us is to consider whether the person was a player, supporter, walking dead, sniper or terrorist in their actions that led to the accident. The reason we do this is more often than not, managers perceive that the person who had the accident was probably below the attitude hurdle. They were a sniper, walking dead or terrorist. And the mission from this part of the exercise is to get people to realize that actually it's our players that have the accidents. It's our high self-esteem, high energy, positive attitude individuals that are can-do individuals that want to make a difference, that take personal shortcuts just to get the job done. And what we have to consider as leaders and managers is our role in that. So having recognized that the person or persons involved in having the accident were probably players, the next challenge for us is to recognize the true depth of culpability within the organization. It is very easy to blame the person who got hurt or the team that allowed him to get hurt. When we consider the level of change that is required within the organization, we need to consider who is it that needs to make that change. The second we start to recognize that there's no such thing as a one-off behavior, therefore everybody did it, it becomes a more systemic issue. Then we're automatically looking at the level of supervision, our systems and procedures, or worse, we could even be looking at our managers and leaders and looking at our beliefs, our values, and our identity as a business. If we always assume the individual is at fault, we consistently miss the learning opportunities that is our systemic culture that's causing the accident in the first place, and therefore we never deal with it. And consequently, we keep repeating the same accidents over and over again and blaming the guy on the ground because he didn't do the right thing. 
use a CAT scan, dig by hand and so on. So having decided who in the organization is responsible or at least has a different choice to make when we talk about trying to prevent this accident or incident happening in the future, we can finally start to look at the thinking. And this is a fairly simple process by just taking the iceberg and the currency trap and just breaking them down into some simple questions. So we start by looking at conditioning and asking ourselves simple questions like, how long have we been doing this and how can we counter that? We can then move up to beliefs and looking at why do people believe this? What are we consistently saying or values? Why is it important for them to carry on behaving this way? And how do we make it more important to, for them to make these changes? We can then look at attitudes and feelings and emotions and how they're affected by the way we currently talk about safety and performance and consider whether we could do it a different way to encourage people to have more positive conversations. And finally, the easiest part of our accident or incident investigation is to look at the complacency trap and ask ourselves which one of the core triggers has created this incident. Now you'll normally find that it's two or three, but one will be evident. So when we look at alpha, where was their head? Was it in a different place? Had they been working long hours? Had they been concentrating on a high risk activity? Was it a slip, trip and fall, a below the knee or above the eye accident? Then we can go to habits. How long have we been doing this? What are the tools or systems or procedures that we're ignoring? And how many other people do it the same way too? Then we look at time versus risk. What were the time pressures? both internal and external that allowed the person to prioritize time over risk in this case. And then personal risk perception. How many times have we done it this way and got away with it? Who else does it this way and gets away with it? And what allows them to consistently think they're going to get away with it? And we can then lead into our consistent communication as the final part of this jigsaw. Because if our consistent communication is meters fixing doing it quickly is more important than doing it safely, then we'll find ourselves in this situation all over again, even if we get everything else right, if we consistently allow people to believe that performance and efficiency is more important than safety, they will always make that judgment as a high self-esteem individual to get the job done. The final part of our reverse bow tie, I guess, is just to consider if we only use it for accidents and incidents, then we just learn how to prevent failure. What happens when we get something really right? You can use the reverse bow tie to examine why we did it well and how do we do it more often. And so you take exactly the same approach for excellence as you do for accident. 